I am a magnet for miracles. Money flows to me. I am meant to have lifelong love. Now, it might sound like I'm bragging here, but those statements are actually three out of 100 affirmations for achieving your goals found on a lifestyle blog. They are meant to be predictions that you tell about yourself. It's believed that by thinking about them, saying them aloud, or writing them down, these statements will become true. This is manifesting. Boy, has the interest in manifesting just skyrocketed. I, I am a powerful manifester. That is a sure sign that your manifestation is indeed on the way. Manifesting is a practice, often understood as a spiritual practice, that has grown in popularity in the early 2020s, especially on social media. It's based on the belief that people can create the lives they desire by aligning their own brain power, focused energies, and the universe's cooperation. We can will our wants into existence by imagining them as already on their way to us. Also known as the law of attraction, the logic behind manifesting rests on a metaphysical understanding in which people are composites of universal energy. Our thoughts and intentions are energetic, and when we think those thoughts, they're sent out into the world to attract similar energies back to us. For manifestors, it's believed that we attract what we create. If we want to be rich, then we have to think about attracting money and being grateful for being rich, even if we're not. Money and love are the most common goals for manifesting, but physical health and mental happiness are also very popular. And while this practice doesn't inherently seem to be religious, the majority of manifestors appeal to a higher power as implicitly aiding their manifestations. And in fact, religious study scholars have started studying this practice in recent years, including Dr. Kira Kiefer, a friend and colleague who you'll hear from throughout this video. Say you want to get a promotion at your job you could potentially manifest by saying every day, I'm so glad that I got this promotion. I'm so happy that I have the extra cash flow now. And if you do those things over and over, the idea is that the universe or a higher power or God is going to kind of boomerang them back to you. So it's a way of kind of pre-enacting what the, the uh, practitioner wants. For some manifestors, this higher power is God, but others appeal to a more generalized understanding of the universe as having both knowledge and sway over the events in our lives. I get to be grateful for my current reality, for everything that I've manifested, everything that I've co-created with God. Manifesting had been extremely popular in the early 2000s, but according to Google Trends, it hit peak popularity in 2020 during the COVID-19 pandemic. Which makes some sense. Manifesting is a highly individualized spiritual practice that doesn't require gathering with others or being in a sacred space. And during a particularly bleak time, adopting a manifesting mindset to envision a better future may have sounded like a good idea to many people. Since then, manifesting was mainstream once again, this time becoming popular among Gen Z women as well as millennials. Manifesting also rode a social media wave, as manifesting influencers and affirmation statements became popular on Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. So where did this practice come from? Given the fact that so many of these manifestors are young and many of them are content creators or follow content creators, it might seem that manifesting is a relatively new practice. And yeah, that's partially true, but even something as seemingly simple as positive thinking has religious and historical roots. In fact, we can trace manifesting through three distinct movements in American religious history. First, a new religious movement called the New Thought Movement, which dates back to the early 19th century, another dynamic era of religious entrepreneurship in the United States. New Thought was more of a diverse collection of practitioners whose work focused on the concept that each individual contained the divine spirit. This spirit was universal and made of the same stuff as God or a universal power. And by stuff, I do mean stuff. Some branches of New Thought focused on spiritual matter that was physically inside of a person, which could be manipulated by using the powers of the mind to heal illnesses or energetic imbalances that led to disease. New Thought leaders drew from diverse ancient philosophies and traditions, notably Hindu wisdom traditions. They were also influenced by Unitarian Christianity and the latest science of the mind known as phrenology. What was new about New Thought was that it pushed back against the popular thinking of the time, the Enlightenment understanding that mind and body were entirely separate. But New Thought thinkers believed that in each person there was a metaphysical linking of the individual's inner mind with a higher cosmic source of spiritual power. This power was clearly mental, but it was also linked to the body. So the idea of a unified or holistic understanding of the mind and body working together was new and exciting in a world dominated by Enlightenment thinking that separated the mind and body. 
In the 19th century, we also saw the rise of what some historians call a medical marketplace of alternative medical practices. Entrepreneurs who believed that their minds were integral to the healing process adapted ideas from the New Thought movement for this medical marketplace. For example, a man named Phineas Quimby wondered if physical illnesses were actually manifestations of our thoughts. He suggested that if we thought the right things, or brought our thoughts into alignment with universal forces, then our bodies would comply and be healthy. He wrote, disease is the effect of a wrong direction of the mind. As you can imagine, new thought became a significant foundation for what we now call holistic medicine or mind-body medicine, which at the time was called mind cure. The Church of Christ Scientist, better known as the Christian Science Church, is probably the best known religious movement that derived from New Thought, although New Thought actually is the basis for many strands of self-help and classical psychology as well. The second tradition in the history of manifesting is best illustrated by the book The Power of Positive Thinking, published in 1952 by Norman Vincent Peale. Peale was a mainline Protestant who served as the pastor of Marble Collegiate Church in New York City from 1932 until 1984. Peale was fascinated with psychiatry, and he saw Christian faith as being closely linked to good mental health. Peale preached that by combining faith in God with thinking positive thoughts, people could overcome obstacles and achieve success in all areas of their lives, from health to wealth. Positive thinking works wonders. In fact, the former president Donald Trump attended Peel's church as a kid and was strongly influenced by Peel's ideas. You know, the greatest speaker I think I've ever witnessed was Dr. Norman Vincent Peel, mm. and he would speak the power of positive thinking. Another influential leader in the space was Louise Hay, a popular self-help writer who popularized some of the core tenets of manifesting through her books, affirmations, and public speaking. If you do a good general positive statement for yourself, the universe will figure out how to manifest that, how to bring that about in your life. Hay was a strong believer in the power of the mind to overcome illness and trauma. She thought healing was the process of bringing one's spirit into alignment with the universe by loving yourself and abandoning negative thoughts. And when we have problems with the arms, it usually means that there's some experience that we're going through that is difficult to embrace or perhaps it's too much. In her 1984 bestseller, You Can Heal Your Life, Hay listed out the points of her philosophy. At the top of the list, we are 100% responsible for all of our experiences. Together, these two paved the way for the self-help book genre and all the consumer goods that go along with it. This brings us to the core text for manifesting, The Secret, which was released in 2006 as a documentary film and a book. The Secret was a pop culture phenomenon. It sold over 30 million copies and has been translated into over 50 languages. Oprah Winfrey, who was already strongly promoting spirituality in her talk show, embraced the book and its main idea, that the universe runs according to the law of attraction. Basically, the message of The Secret is the message that I've been trying to uh, uh, share with the world on my show for the past 21 years. The message is that you're really responsible for your life. The law of attraction is one law. There are many laws working in the world. But it is very true that the way you think creates reality for yourself. So we can see that manifesting as a tool or ideology for self-help dates back to its new thought roots. But we should also consider the third historical movement that inspired manifesting, New Age spirituality. During the 60s and 70s countercultural revolution, many young people who fought for progressive causes also rejected their parents' religious traditions and looked for alternative religious practices. They especially drew inspiration from Asian religious traditions like Hinduism, Buddhism, and Taoism. They embraced the idea of oneness, that there's one spiritual or universal energy shared among all living beings, which was an idea also found in the New Thought movement a century before. They also adopted practices like postural yoga, meditation, chanting mantras, and visualization meditation, adapting these as individualized practices that you can do alone, without a broader religious community or tradition. Manifesting fit right into this repertoire of rituals as an individualized practice of self-improvement. So how do people go about practicing manifesting? We've talked a little bit about this, but some of the most common ways to practice are similar to those New Age practices related to centering the mind or meditating. Manifestors are instructed that meditating about gratitude is the key to success. As the author of The Secret explains, there are just two words standing between you and the life of your dreams. Thank you. In other words, being thankful for what you desire, for something you don't yet have, puts the energy into the universe that's required to attract the desired outcome back to you, whether that's health, wealth, or love. 
Manifesting influencers recommend all sorts of methods for doing this, including visualization and vision boarding, basically creating a visual representation of your goals. Both of these use imagery to help express desires, whether it be imagining money hitting your bank account or your new business at the top of Google search results. To help achieve their goals, manifestors also use the repetition of affirmations, or positive statements. Some instructors recommend writing an affirmation down repeatedly every day or writing a letter to the universe. Others recommend speaking affirmations aloud throughout the day in regular intervals. Manifesting's focus on positive thinking also dovetails with pop psychology and therapy trends especially cognitive behavioral therapy, a psychological treatment method for anxiety and depression. One therapeutic strategy is to emphasize positive self-talk and minimize negative self-talk. This is done in order to remove obstacles in your life that cause unnecessary anxiety. In many ways, this is manifesting at work, but because manifesting has ventured into the world of pop psychology and therapy, some critics have voiced concern about its potential to do more harm than good. One of the key critiques is aimed at its emphasis on individual agency. Manifesting places so much agency on the individual that some argue that it denies or overlooks inequalities built into society. The manifesting mindset does not really align with the fact that the zip code where we're born is a strong predictor for our economic and health outcomes. Moreover, there are other things that are out of our control. For example, a genetic predisposition for certain diseases. Some argue that this clashes with ideas like Hay's philosophy, that we are 100% responsible for everything in our life. Critics of manifesting argue that this emphasis on individual agency and success could create a cycle of victim blaming that might negatively affect someone's mental health. So we've traced the history of manifesting from the New Thought movement all the way through the publication of The Secret. But what accounts for its current trendiness as a social media phenomenon? In some ways, we have to consider the phrase, the medium is the message. Coined by the media theorist Marshall McLuhan, the phrase means that the medium used to communicate a message, whether that's a newspaper article, a YouTube video, a clay tablet, or semaphore signals, inherently influences how the message is perceived and understood. In other words, the characteristics of the medium itself shape the nature of the message and the way it's interpreted. Manifesting is making a resurgence in part because of today's communication medium of choice, social media. Manifesting is perfectly adapted to how information is shared on social media. Now, manifesting itself may require a lot of focus and commitment, but the core principles of manifesting are relatively simple and can be translated into short-form content. Take affirmations, for example. Short, impactful content perfectly suited for TikTok or Instagram. I am an amazing person. Content about manifesting also appeals to a broad audience. It's generally apolitical and doesn't feel religious in any obvious or traditional way. So it's not particularly controversial nor aimed at a particular religious community. Manifesting has also benefited from influencer culture, where people position themselves as spiritual guides, sharing their success stories that they attribute to manifesting. Manifesting influencers also teach techniques to their followers to learn and use for themselves to achieve their own goals. Use this one affirmation to manifest money within 24 hours. I want you to comment down below if you manifest any sort of money within 24 hours. I'm assured to you that it will work. As scholars of religion started studying this practice, some noticed that manifesting guides and content about manifesting are branded with a noticeably feminine vibe and marketed to women, and that most manifesting influencers are also women. In fact, the majority of self-identified manifestors are women as well. As religious studies scholar Kira Kiefer has argued, manifesting is a spiritual practice that some contemporary American women have used to spiritualize making money. Manifesting is extremely popular among women, and I have written about the concept of what I call women's spiritual entrepreneurship, which is women entrepreneurs who kind of justify or validate their desire to make money by making it a service, a spiritual service for their customers. And manifesting fits right into that because it's like something that you do for yourself, but also for others. Dr. Kiefer argues that women's spiritual entrepreneurship often takes the form of three types of businesses, multi-level marketing companies known as MLMs, self-help products, and women's business coaching, which often use manifesting as a strategy, including selling manifesting guides and classes. But why do these entrepreneurs spiritualize their businesses? How does spirituality fit in? So the reason this is spiritualized or reason why it can be spiritualized is because the, the woman entrepreneur who is making her living or trying to make her living by selling through an MLM wants to show her uh, customers that what she's selling is beneficial to them 
on a on a bigger scale. And so women who participate in them validate what they do by emphasizing how spiritually fulfilling it is um, to both make money and help others. In other words, Dr. Kiefer argues that women spiritual entrepreneurs focus on spiritual fulfillment and use the language of helping others as a way to justify and validate their money-making endeavors. It's a spiritual practice, but also a sales tactic, carving out a space in online entrepreneurship, which has been traditionally assumed to be a masculine endeavor and historically dominated by male influencers, especially in the whole financial freedom and wealth-building corner of the internet. Women do oftentimes feel the need to justify or validate why they need to be successful or why they can be successful. And the reason, the ways they do that is by applying a type of spirituality to what they are doing. It's spiritualizing their work. I argue that the spiritual entrepreneurship angle often includes manifesting and that, again, manifesting is brought in as this um, way of helping the average person set goals and try and realize them through their own positive thinking. But it's this very individualism that makes manifesting an important topic for scholars of religion to pay attention to. More and more Americans have disaffiliated from traditional religious institutions, but that doesn't mean that they're less religious. We just have to look at religion differently, not only as a group-based activity. Manifesting is built on the belief in a higher power. It's a spiritual practice that uses a metaphysical and philosophical understanding of how the universe operates and humanity's role in it. But it's a spiritual practice that's not tied to any particular religion. Sociologists of religion have been studying more individualized forms of religiosity for years, often calling it spirituality and often studying it under the subfield of lived religion. Lived religion is all about what people actually do. Not assuming that religion is all about the ideals or dogmas that may be stated by a particular authority or text. Manifesting falls under this umbrella because it's individualistic, creative, adaptive, and subverts traditional forms of power. For example, manifesting has grown in popularity among American Christians. This is lived religion. It's not mentioned in Christian scripture or encouraged by Christian authorities. In fact, some Christian influencers have condemned it, arguing that it denies the sovereignty of God. This concept of manifesting is not biblical and you should stop using this word. This is what makes manifesting such a great example of lived religion. It's an example of how religion is practiced and experienced by ordinary people, rather than an official spokesperson or an official sacred text. In the words of the sociologist of religion, Meredith McGuire, what might we discover if instead of looking at affiliation or organizational participation, we focused first on individuals, the experiences they consider most important, and the concrete practices that make up their personal religious experience and expression? We can learn a lot about what people value and how these values are shaped by our culture when we investigate practices such as manifesting. Practices that might fall under the radar with a traditional understanding of what counts as religion and with a traditional understanding understanding of who counts as a spiritual authority. If you want to learn more about manifesting, the creator Joe Scott, known for his YouTube channel Answers with Joe, has a video on the neuroscience behind manifesting. Now, whether or not manifesting actually works is a question for theologians to debate, but scientists and religious studies scholars would say that manifesting works insofar as rituals like visualization and chanting mantras do affect how you think and act. Joe Scott explains how practices like this can literally strengthen pathways in your brain. It's a great video and you can watch it exclusively on Nebula. Nebula is a streaming platform where you can watch your favorite content creators in an ad-free environment. On Nebula, you can find podcasts, behind-the-scenes videos, and Nebula Originals, original series that you can find only on Nebula. And because Nebula creators are free from the advertiser-friendly algorithm, Nebula Originals often cover topics that otherwise would be suppressed or demonetized on YouTube like Real Life Lore's original series, Modern Conflicts, a deep dive into the armed conflicts of the 21st century. Nebula also offers classes taught by your favorite creators. In today's video, we talked a lot about influencers trying to manifest successful content creation businesses. And if you're interested in that topic, but not so much into the manifesting, then you should really check out Business 101 for Creators, taught by Thomas Frank, where you can learn about the finer points of running an online business, everything from bookkeeping to hiring. I'm a Nebula creator too, and what I love about Nebula is that it's creator business built and creator-owned. This means that when you sign up for Nebula, you are directly supporting me. 
You are helping me create more Religion for Breakfast videos, and you're supporting some of the most passionate and dedicated educational creators out there. If you sign up using my link below, you can get both Nebula and Nebula classes for a 40% discount off of annual plans. And those annual plans are a great deal at just over $2.5 a month. Again, click the link in the comments below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.